Welcome to our LB's The Lover of Books author chat. Now to introduce this wonderful novelist. Rebecca Ross writes fantasy novels for teens and adults. She lives in the Appalachian foothills of the Northeast Georgia with her husband, their lively Australian shepherd, and an endless pile of books. I think we all love our books. Um, the Queen's Rising, The Queen's Resistance, Sisters of Sword and Song, and Dreams Lie Beneath are her titles for young adult readers. And A River Enchanted is her adult fantasy debut which just was published this past February. And here we are with the sequel coming up on Tuesday, we're also excited for, Ready to Follow. When not writing, she can be found reading in her garden where she grows wildflowers and story ideas. I love that. Let's welcome her because she's the number one Sunday Times bestseller and a book of the month pick, sparkling debut fantasy with Celtic tones set in the magical Isle of Cadence where two childhood enemies must team up to discover why girls are going missing from their clan. Booklist says it's a vivid fantasy that is impossible to put down and Publishers Weekly agrees and says it's vividly imagined. This will appeal to a lover of fantasy from Name of the Wind to the Earth Sea series. Let's give her a big round of applause. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, how do you, like that's the description. How do you like to describe this book? So if I had to pitch it in like one sentence, yes, it is a grumpy bard must team up with his childhood rival to find out why girls are going missing on their island. Now, did you, as I understand it, when you started this novel, it was not going to be an adult novel. Is that correct? Like you hadn't really thought, oh, I'm going to write an adult novel. Right. So I had previously written three other young adult novels. And so I was preparing my next novel in my option book, as they call it. So I was about to present it to my editor. And so as I was writing this book, I just assumed it was going to be young adults. And I was really taken by surprise as I was drafting it because Torin and Sidra, who I knew were in their late 20s, um, they really took over a lot of the manuscript <laughs> and I originally thought it was going to be more of a Jack and Adara story and their their story arc was very much more of the YA coming of age, um, but Torrin and Sidra were definitely not. And so I remember as I was drafting the book, I was sending it chapter by chapter to my critique partner, Isabelle Ibanez, who also writes young adult fantasy books. And so she reached the first chapter of Sidra's and she sent me a text and was like, is this YA or adult? And as soon as she asked me that, I was like, oh no, like I'm, I'm probably writing an adult novel and I don't realize it yet. Um, and so I was like, I can't worry about this. Um, but she was like, I think this would be a great adult novel. Um, so I just kept writing it and I felt like I literally was just writing a book that I wanted to read. So I could tell by the end that um, there, there were some YA elements, and I think it's because YA is what I know, it's what I'm familiar with. I had written YA previously, um, but I could also tell that I was hungry to write about older characters, themes I hadn't touched on yet in YA. And so it's like this 50-50 split, and I sent it to my agent, and I was like, I don't know what this is. And she read and was like, you're right, like it could go really either way. Um, but I think I just had to, you know, at the end of the day, I was like, I don't want to take out Torn and Sidra's arc. Like I was very much in love with it. I felt like it was very vital to the story. Um, and I think I would have had to either age them down or really remove them. And I was like, I don't want to do that. So I just decided I need to take it to the adult side of the market, which felt a little scary because I had no reassurance it would sell. And so I just revised it a couple times, like really elevating Jack and Adara, Adara's story arc to try to make them feel a little bit older in tone. Um, and so then, yeah, I went on submission and found a really great editor. And so I'm very glad that I kind of went with my gut and I decided, you know, I went, I went with the adult side because I think it has done so well, um, really has surpassed all my expectations for the book. Um, and it has really um, found a lot of readers that I, I think, you know, had never heard of me. I think with Book of the Month, I was completely shocked when they chose it because they don't normally choose fantasy books. Every now and then they will. And I had quite a few readers be like, I don't normally ever read fantasy, but I read this and loved it. So I was like, yes, like, you know, my job is done here. You know, that I, I wrote a fantasy book that is still very accessible to people who don't normally read fantasy. Absolutely. So you, you get this to your agent, but it's an option book. So it does the publisher, when they ask for an option, are they asking for a YA or 
is it, I mean, is that sort of what your agent had to sell is look, I know you asked for YA, but we're giving you an adult. <laughs> yeah. So it was kind of interesting. So my agent was like, well, let's submit it and see what my editor at Harper Teen thinks. And if she's like, oh, this is definitely an adult novel. Then we would kind of know, but my editor wanted it. So I was like, oh goodness. Like that didn't really give me an answer, you know, as far as like, do I take this adult or not? So um, the thing that really came down to it though, is that Harper Teen wanted one book from me. They wanted a standalone and I was very dead set on this being a duology just because how the book ends. I was like, I just don't think, you know, I have so many, I have so much going on in this book that I need one more novel to really wrap things up. And so I just had to be like, you know what? I don't think this is the right fit for Harper teen. I think I need to take this to the adult side. And so I ended up pitching Harper a different, I was like, I can write you a standalone. So here's an idea. And it ended up being Dreams Lie Beneath. So I pitched them Dreams Lie Beneath. They were very happy with that. And then that enabled me to take A River Enchanted on submission to the adult side of the market. Nice. So that appeased them enough and then you could <laughs> keep one with us. Okay. So where do you define where YA ends and adult begins then because it's like you said it's sort of split and is it age is it topic is it material I mean how, how do you define that for us as an audience yeah so I think sometimes people think it is age um and and of course when you're writing YA you typically have teen narrators like I do think that is a pretty important thing to have but you have adult novels that feature teen protagonists in the same way like I'm thinking of The Bear and the Nightingale by Catherine Arden. Sometimes I see those books shelved as YA when they are really adult and it is a coming of age story. Um, so we see the main character as a young woman, but she grows up throughout it. Um, so I don't necessarily like, will say it's age just because you can have younger protagonists and adult. Um, I honestly think it really comes down to your audience. So are you writing for teens? Are you writing for adults? Um, and there is, I will say like some teen YA books do deal with very difficult, um, topics. So it's not necessarily the topics, but I do think how they are handled. Like you are probably not going to find a very graphic romance scene in a young adult novel. There are certain things you do want to keep in mind. Um, but yeah, and I also think the pacing is a pretty big thing. So with YA, you want to have a very fast pace. Um, a lot of times they want to keep you, if you're writing fantasy, they want it to be at 100,000 words. Like they don't want anything too long in, in YA. Whereas adults, like really the sky's the limit. You could go, you know, you can write a pretty thick book, <laughs> which is nice. Um, and you can have a much slower pace. So I think also when I was writing River Enchanted, I knew I was really writing a slow burn story. And I was like, I just don't know. Like, I'm sure there will be teens who love it. But as far as it's sitting on the YA shelf, I was like, I think because it's very character driven. Um, it might be moving a little too slow for teen readers or typically what with my YAs, I've had my editor every single time when I turn in a manuscript for my YA novels, they're like, we need to cut about a hundred pages. And I would be like, oh my gosh, this is so hard having to cut a hundred pages off my manuscript and revisions, but it's a true thing. Like you really want to keep your pace up. So I do think it's a, it's a number of different elements that come together that really separate the two. Um, so yeah, I know sometimes it can be, I think some people, again, they will shelf some adult novels in YA, um, and a lot of times because they are women authors. And so sometimes I think that can be a little bit frustrating if you're a woman writing fantasy, adult fantasy and getting shelved as YA, you know, sometimes it happens. I write both. So, you know, I totally understand how that can happen, but, um, there are, there are distinctions between the two. Well, we spoke, uh, the LB spoke with Kai Harris about what the Fireflies knew, which is a, a young narrator, but it's an adult mm -hmm. book. And it was actually a book of the month um, side pick. So it was very interesting to hear how she had to fight to keep yeah. it as an adult novel, you know, because of the age they wanted to push it down. But it's, I find that fascinating. All right. So you have this fantasy world. How do you come up with the rules? Like, you know, certain things have to happen consistently throughout for it to make sense. Do you write that along the way? Do you think, oh, this is kind of a mainstream that I want to flow through? Or how do you come up with your, your differences in the real world versus your world? Yeah, I think when it comes to world building, I am a discovery writer. So a lot of times, almost all of my books have started 
with me envisioning a character in a very like, unique or intriguing situation where I have to continue asking questions like, well, where are you at? And why is this happening to you? And like, where are you heading? What is your goal? Um, with the River Enchanted, it was very unique where I saw the island first. So I saw this very misty, beautiful place. It was very reminiscent to the Isle of Skye. So I knew right off the bat, it was like very inspired by Scotland. Um, and I, I could also see the enchantments right away. So I knew the roads were the only thing on the aisle that didn't shift and move, but the hills, the locks, the trees could all shift and move as so you could easily get lost if you strayed from the road. I also could see right off the bat that the wind carried gossip. So you wanted to be careful what you said out in the open because your words could be carried. And um, and then I eventually found, I found Torn and Sidra next. And so I was very like intrigued by them. I knew they had a marriage of convenience. Um, and I just had to continue asking questions. And then I found Adara and then I found Jack. And once I found Jack, I knew he was going to be um, the main protagonist and that he was returning back to the aisle. So I was very intrigued by all this. So I just sat down and began writing. So I'm a very, I'm very much a discovery writer. So I discover most of my stories as I go, which can be very exhilarating and very terrifying at the same time. Because sometimes I don't know exactly like where I'm going or I might see like a vague way that I want the ending to wrap up, but I'm still not exactly 100% sure until I get further into the manuscript. Um, and so as far as like world building and rules, like a lot of times, like it's like it's just a very organic way of discovering it. So um, a lot of times I will just put everything down on the page in the first draft. And then I really have to rely on my revisions to go back through and make sure things make sense, especially like with magic systems. They can be painful to try to create because they do. You want them to make sense or they have rules and you have to remember those rules. Um, so I know, at least with the magic system and River Enchanted, that came it became clearer and clearer with each draft that I went through when I had some good feedback from my critique partner, from beta readers that really helped me also like figure out like what parts of the world building weren't making sense or they needed more clarification on. Um, but for me, it really is just like a process. And again, just asking myself questions um, and exploring it on the page. So do you ever carry over roles from books you've written before into the series or do you always start fresh on that world building? I typically will start fresh. And if I, if I look back on the other books I've written, um, they are, they are very different from each other. Um, there might be some similarities such, such as like if they're very character driven stories, but as far as like the world building, the magic, I really like to change it up with each, with each book or series that I'm doing. So it feels very fresh and new. I guess it's just so much work building <laughs> an entire world and in two books, you're done with it. And so my question is, and I probably should ask this at the end, but I know you said this is two books, but would you ever consider generally generationally letting this book fall to like Maisie or Freda, like letting them have this world again and letting their stories come through because they are such interesting characters in themselves, you know? Yeah, I, I won't lie and say I haven't thought about it because I have. Um, I just like, I think I would really like, if I ever did like a continuation, I really want it to be like a really strong book. So I don't think I have all the pieces for it yet, but I think because these characters in this world, they are very vivid to me. I, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm done with it. And especially if it's something that readers want, like if they, a lot of times, you know, if you want to add on another book in a series, a publisher will not do it unless they, they feel like it's going to sell well. So if the series hasn't done very well, then they might be like, no, we're not interested. If the series has done well, then they'd be like, oh, yes, we want you to add on another book or a prequel or, you know, a uh, continuation, like you said, with the next generation. Um, so it really does kind of come down to a little bit what your publisher wants. But I think, again, if I ever did add one more book, like I would I would want it to feel like its own thing while still honoring the duology. So I think it would be like... Um, I don't know, a big, a big role to fill. So I, I might not be there yet, but I won't say I haven't thought about it. Gotcha. <laughs> do you have plans to return to, I mean, I know you were about to have a fire and list out, but do you have plans to return back to the adult fantasy or fiction world? Or do you see yourself mainly laying in that YA stretch? 
Yeah. So my next book will be YA. Um, it's called Divine Rivals. It's coming out April 4th with Wednesday Books. I will say that is an upper YA, so it has a lot of appeal, crossover appeal to adults. Um, it is a duology, so I'm currently drafting the sequel to that book. So I've been very preoccupied with this sequel, trying to get it done. Um, but I am very eager to sit down with my brainstorming journal and begin to think about my next adult project. So I definitely have more stories in mind for adult things. Um, I just need to figure out like which of my ideas needs to come next and like figure out like how I feel like right now I have a few really like really tantalizing ideas. I just don't know if I've really fully thought them through. And I just haven't had like the time or energy because again, I'm having to give everything to drafting uh, the sequel to Divine Rivals. But once once that book's turned in, like, like I said, I'm just, I really want to sit down and think about it because um, I do, I really, I have really enjoyed writing for an adult audience. So I would say, hopefully I have more stories to tell on that front. How fast do you write? I mean, that's, I mean, this book came out in what, February? And now in December you have the sequel. So did you pretty much write both of them back to back as you knew? I mean, obviously it was a cliffhanger. So, I mean, it seems like you're just a super fast writer. So I will say I favor drafting. Um, I think it took me about two months to write A River Enchanted, which is a very fast, um, a fast schedule. But keep in mind, I write full time. I don't have any kids. So I literally will get up first thing in the morning and sit and will draft most of the day. And when I have a story like this, like on my mind that I know, like, I know it's good and I know like, okay, I have all the pieces together to make a good story. I literally can't sleep at night. So I lay down, I'll start thinking about it. So I'm like, okay, I have got to get this draft done as quickly as possible so I can sleep at night. Um, but I do like, I love the thrill of the first draft. So drafting comes more naturally to me. I'd rather see a blank page than a page full of my words that I have to revise. Like revisions are a lot, they're just more difficult for me. Um, but I do, um, I think the past Goodness. So I had Dreams Lie Beneath come out November of last year. Then I had River Enchanted come out February of this year. I'm having a Fire Endless come out December of this year. And then I have Divine Rivals coming out April. So that's like four books in two years. And I, I have learned that's a little bit too much because I have lived like deadline to deadline. Uh, so I probably need to slow down. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, it's hard. Sometimes like I feel like I'll go a long period of time where I have no story ideas and I just don't know what's coming next. And then all of a sudden, like I will see something and then I will just, it'll be like a frenzy trying to get it drafted. And um, so yeah, it's kind of like wherever the muse leads me, but yeah. So typically I think I have kind of figured out how to draft a book in about two months. That's impressive. Now, not only did you develop the world of cadence, but you had an inner world as well. And it really only applied to Sidra as I remember with her dreams. Um, and it, you know, like I wasn't expecting her to see Danella appear and like come out of and basically go into her world. Is that, do you have plans to do more of that in A Fire Endless or is that just, I guess, I guess I just, I love that element and there wasn't much of it in A River Enchanted. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to think, um, honestly, there are not too many dream sequences there might not be any dream sequences at all um, but what I can say is one of the characters does cross to the other side of the veil so they are in the spirits realm and it makes for a very interesting situation where they can see all the humans but the humans can't see them and I don't want to give a spoiler if you read the description of a fire endless I think it like kind of tells who which one of the four ends up crossing the veil um and so it's a very it's almost like a dreamlike sequence because like you know they are seeing all this but they can't be seen or touched and so um it is kind of a dilemma and then it's like oh how and then time passes differently so it passes slower in the spirits realm and it passes much faster in the mortal realm so like a day in the spirits realm could be like 10 days in the mortal realm. So it's kind of like this sense of urgency. Like I have to have to get out of here, you know, return to my life before everyone I love has, you know, aged and passed away. Almost like the underwater experience. for yes. this moment. I love that. <laughs> um, now, what I did really love too, is your thought to what would be enchanted and how it would be enchanted and what the effects would be mm -hmm. and what, was really cool is that you think, oh, enchanted, you know, if a sword slices that it would be detrimental, 
you know, harmful to the character, but really it was the reverse in both instances. So one where, you know, with the truth blade was, you know, you think that that would be used for your advantage. I mean, you know, your opponent against your opponent, but really it ended up bringing Jack and Adira closer in that moment. Um, did you put thought into that, like intentional, like making a weapon be more of a solution? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think <clears throat> with the truth blade, um, so it is a, a jerk that Jack's father had crafted for him. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think because there is some mystery around who his dad is, I was trying to think like I could see like Marin wearing this blade. Um, and then her giving it to Jack being like, this is a blade your dad had crafted for you. We don't know. I don't know what the enchantment is because I've never used it, but you know, she's been carrying it around. So I just remember thinking as I'm writing this out, like what would, what would be a good thing for this blade to be enchanted by? And again, because there's been so many secrets, I was like, well, what if it was truth? So whoever is cut by it has to speak truth. And and then I kind of let my mind wander with that. I was like, well, what if Jack Nadera had a moment where both of them were kind of struggling to open up and be vulnerable um, and just have a moment where they completely like, you know, let themselves both like be free to be vulnerable and like share these things. And so it was really interesting, again, like how I guess things develop in my mind. Um, but yes, yeah, like on the page, it is, it's, I didn't really realize that too. I mean, we do have Torin getting wounded um by well, and he, he's the same way i mean when he becomes mute and he can't communicate it brings him and Sidra closer it makes yeah, him yeah. stop thinking through yeah. everything and just being the moment and so it really did the opposite of harm mm -hmm. to both those major <laughs> couples which i find fascinating right because it it opens up well is it a weapon you know kind right of yeah no i love i love how you how you picked up on that um, the next thing I want to talk about is um, the title of the book. Has it always been A River Enchanted? <laughs> so I, when I first drafted it, it was downstream. And I have always wanted <laughs> to have a title that was one word. I don't know what it is about one word titles. I love them. Um, but they are so hard to convince your publishing team to go with. Um, and so I remember like my agent actually was the one she was like, well, like, I just don't think downstream is magical enough. Like it's not conveying the magical elements, which she was right. So I was like, okay. And that's the thing about fantasy books. It's with titles. It's so hard because you do want to give the reader some sense of what they can expect in a title, like right. gone girl, like, you know, these very catchy, like titles that's like, okay, like I'm getting a sense of what I can expect. Um, so with fantasy books, like you, you are trying to convey the sense of magic. Um, so it was downstream. And so then I, I came up with the river enchanted. Um, and then we, we changed it to seeing up the river with my editor. And the funny thing was, is Harper Voyager UK was very interested in partnering with us to release the book in the UK. Well, they came back just like, Hey, we think the title of river enchanted will be better for our market than seeing up the river. So are you okay changing it back to River Enchanted? So I was like, you know what? That's fine. <laughs> like I've already announced that I changed it to like all my followers was like, you know, this has happened. Like where you go back and forth with titles or change them at the last minute. Uh, <clears throat> so it seemed like it was always supposed to be titled a River Enchanted because it just ended up back at a River Enchanted. And I do really, really love the title. Um, so I just guess it was just a good fit for it. <clears throat> I do too. And I love that it's a clue within itself and we don't know it when we first read it. So I was very worried that people would think it was spoilery. And so that was one of the reasons why I was like, well, maybe we should change it. My editor's like, I don't think like people think it's too spoilery, but I have had readers get very upset about certain things. Um, like my previous YA books that were like, I had a family genealogy in the Queen's Rising. Um, and they, they were like, this spoils, this spoils the plot twist in the books. So I was like, oh my goodness, please take, you know, we need to fix the genealogy tree. Cause again, I just, I wasn't thinking about it. So I'm like very sensitive. It's like, I don't want to spoil anything. So, um, but I do think you're right. Like a lot of readers really won't. It's not till you get further into the book that you might, you know, pick yeah, up. You get, yeah, you get the Thank aha you. moment. Yeah, it's right. like, ah, that's why she named it. Because, you know, it is so, it is such a magical title mm -hmm. that you think, oh, it's just triggering me to what type of book it is. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily that that's going to be the clue that gets people across the border, right? So it's, um, I, I enjoyed that. I thought it was clever. 
Um, the other thing that I thought was really fascinating was the dichotomy of the island, the give and take. Um, so to get the magical powers of the plants, like for instance, when she's trying to help um, her husband, Sidra, and she has to, you know, it, it's harmful for her to gather. Was it thistle? Is that it, right? It was, I called it the fire spur. So it is some yeah. type of plant that yeah. caused big blisters on her hands to touch. Right. And so she has to sacrifice to the land, basically, to be able to take from it to heal her husband. And it seems like that's a pretty common theme throughout. Like there's this, you know, give and take with the forging, with the weaving, with the singing. I mean, there's um, there's this constant back and forth. And I just wanted you to talk a little bit about that because it seems to be a, a very reoccurrent theme throughout every character, you know, every plot line. Um, it was just, I loved it. Yeah, so I think with a lot of times, especially with, with magic systems or with magic, you know, you have to kind of think, is there going to be a cost to the character to wield it or not? And I do think it can create a lot of like wonderful tension when there is like this payoff or this price one must pay. And it's interesting that, um, and they're like, I, this book has been through so many drafts, but in one of the earlier drafts, um, I did not have, like when Jack was playing for the spirits, there was absolutely no cost to his health. And my editor actually made the suggestion of like, what if like, it's like him casting magic because he is singing these very powerful songs that are bring, like literally making the spirits manifest and draw, like they're drawn to him. Like, what if it's very similar to how, like when Marin is weaving an enchanted plaid, like there is a cost to his health. Like what, what will that do to the story? And it just added so much tension to it because even thinking like Adara was not fully she wasn't aware of it so then not only is it for Jack trying to figure out like do I want to stay and be part of the east and keep you know playing for the spirits at the cost of my own health and then even for Adara like do I want to keep asking Jack to do this knowing it has a cost for him but I do think it just adds again just like so much more tension to the story um and so it was one of those things I think that again, came very naturally, just like with thinking about Mirren and weaving a secret into a plaid, like even just holding, it's like, I could just envision her holding someone's secret, like in her chest, and like the weight of that and her weaving that secret. And then she has to continue carrying the secret. Like, you know, what would that do? So again, I kind of let my imagination roam with that. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. There is this sense of give and take with the island. Well, I love that they suggested to add Jack to that give and take because he was so angry that his mother his mother's health was waning because she did all this and he couldn't understand it he and it wasn't it. until he had to make that decision and Sidra basically said well would you stop singing well no so you know a personal decision versus one that someone else is making also adds to that I don't know the tension and, and you know is it okay for me to make the choice but not to allow someone else to make that choice as well um, I, I thought that was clever. Um, now, how about Sidra with her having to discover herself before she can help others? That was um, a theme that was um, brought up. Is that is that on the same lines or do you see that as different? Um, I see it as a little bit different. I think so. I don't know if you're familiar with the Enneagram test. It's a personality test that you take. And it assigns you one of nine numbers. And um, so with each of my four main characters, I like assign them a number on the Enneagram because I thought it would be very helpful, helpful for me, like developing them. Like what is their personalities? And even like the Enneagram, it goes into very deep, like very big details. If you ever take it and get a number, like you could spend a lot of time reading about like, they'll talk about what your fears are. You'll, they'll talk about what your greatest motivation and desire is, you know, whether it's to belong or feel secure, et cetera you know, how you act under pressure when you're being very unhealthy, you know, ex, you know, things like that. Um, so I think just like it's part of Sidra's personality. I think that she will always, she's a two on the Enneagram, which is like the helper. So she's always going, she, she would run herself ragged helping other people before she slows down and like takes care of herself, which I think we definitely see in the story. But I also thought it was just a very interesting um, conflict in her where she has healed all these other people 
And it's like, she has not taken the time to really sit back and heal herself, but how much more difficult it is to do that when you have a wound um, and you're grieving and you're angry and you're, you're waiting for an answer that might not ever come. And, um, and just even just going through everything with Torin, like with her, with her marriage to Torin, and I felt for both of them, they individually need to figure things out <laughs> before they can really come together and heal as one. Um, so yeah, I didn't necessarily see Sidra as like, you know, I didn't, I actually never really thought of it as how like Jack or Mirren are, you know, reacting with magic and the, the passion and the cost that they have. But so with Sidra, I feel like it was a little bit more like internal where she is having to like really reckon with these things that she's thinking and feeling because she has kind of put them off by trying to keep herself busy helping other people. Do you, okay. I'm so glad you brought up this test. Do you do this for every book <laughs> or is that specifically for this duology? So I, I haven't done it for my other books, no. But with this one, I think because like these characters, you know, this was like the first story of mine where I had multiple narrators. All my other books, I think, you know, The Queen's Resistance, I did, I had dual narration and Sisters of Sword and Song. I had, I was alternating between the two sisters, but this is the first time I've literally had like five points of view, if you include Frey. And I know Frey, she has a few chapters, not a lot. Um, it's like, these are a lot of characters to have to juggle and weave together and really figure out what their motivations are. What are their fears? What do they desire? Like, what are their weaknesses? And so it just helped me, I think, to see them in the Enneagram test to, to stay true to character. So do you mind telling us where they fall on the chart? Yes. So Adair is a one, Sidra is a two, uh, Jack is a four, and Torin is a six. Okay. And the interesting thing is I am a four. So that's the individualist. A lot of writers wind up being fours. So it's kind of funny when you have another writer who's not a four. It's like, oh, this is like amazing. You're not a four, you know. Um, so I think though with writing Jack, like I understood him pretty well, like a little bit of his like, not necessarily grumpiness, but he's very sensitive. Um, he's very creative. Uh, he's kind of withdrawn. And so I, again, like I understood that because I, I have the same type of tendencies um and he started off like he was our main like he was our eyes and ears for right. the beginning chunk of it which was pretty cool um so when you because I'm just going off because this test is pretty cool um you mentioned that you have a partner that y'all you work back and forth Isabel to is she also a four or do you like to work with someone who's not like you so you know because you work off of each other right help each other She's also a four. <laughs> so, but I think it helps us like we really like, I think me and Isabel especially were like, we're like the same person in like two different bodies. It's almost like so strange. But I think when you meet a friend like that who just completely gets you, like I remember like we met each other um online first was Instagram. And I just I I, I debuted in 2018 and she debuted in 2020. So I just remember like when my debut came out, like she was like so friendly and like sharing the news about the Queen's Rise. Like, who is this lovely person? You know, so I followed her back. And um, so we just were like chatting on Instagram. And and then when her book came out, Woven in Moonlight 2020, she's like, hey, would you want to do like a tour stop with me in Atlanta since I am local to Atlanta? I said, absolutely. So the first time I met her was like right before like her event, like I went and picked her up at the airport. But I took her to my house and she was like looking at all the books on my bookshelf. And she's like, I have like all of the same books. Like it was just one of those like weird things. Like and some of them were quite obscure books, like not a lot of other people have. Um, so I think it is nice when you find somebody like that who like kind of gets you. That's pretty cool. I mean, and, you know, you hear how close the literary world can be. And it seems like it's especially been that for y'all through, you know, all this quarantine, like having someone like that to bounce ideas off of to talk to it makes it not so isolated yes I agree now part of this um story it deals with music do you have a a previous relationship with music or is this strictly just something you wrote in because it seems so personal right that it was it was something that as soon as he played the the hall changed colors and movement and um it really brought alive the fantasy part especially at the beginning is that something that that you do you play or do you sing I mean do you have any relationship with music I wish I could sing I I cannot even carry a tune in a bucket like uh, <laughs> that's one of my things I wish I could do um but I did I played the cello in high school 
I very much enjoyed it. It's one of my deepest regrets that I didn't like carry on with it. Um, because I think just with college, like things just got really busy. And so I just stopped playing, but I will say this is not the first time that I've written a story where music is very much like connected to the magic. So sisters of sword and song is another book of mine where, um, music is very much in tune with the magic. And so I honestly think it's just like how, like I perceive music that it feels like, I don't know, just almost otherworldly at some times, at some points where, um, a lot of times I will listen to music as I'm writing. A lot of times they are soundtrack scores. So like, you know, very like emotional, like instrumental music. Um, and it does like, it just feels like just very magical listening to songs like that while I'm writing. Like I can still like go back and listen to songs like years after I've written a book. And I will remember like the exact like scene I was writing when I was listening to that song. It's almost like woven into the book. Okay, well, this is a perfect follow-up. Do you have a playlist? Have you shared a playlist for, for this novel that we can hear? Yes, so um, I make playlists for all my books. And you can find me on Spotify at Becca J. Ross. Um, so yes, uh, there are quite a few songs for River Enchanted that I listen to, so you can find them all there. And you can also find Fire Endless's uh, playlist as well. So that's already been released on Spotify as well? Okay, yeah. perfect. Excellent. <laughs> did you know when you were writing this book you were going to leave us on a cliffhanger <laughs> I did actually so as I was starting to write like I knew I knew what the plot twist was early on so it's like you know how am I going to work to this twist and so um I think like a very much initially like I thought I was going to write a standalone but then as I was writing and I could see where the plot twist was going to fall at the climax it's like well obviously I need another book to really like continue to, you know, develop these ideas. And if I am leaving these characters in such a way, like, you know, I need to have one more book to really resolve things. Um, so we have the mystery of the girls getting solved in this book. Um, and there is another mystery that kind of sprouts up in a fire endless. So both books have somewhat of like mysterious undertones to them. Um, but yes, and I do, I, you know, I don't typically write like, like cliffhanger this is like the first book I've written that had ends on a cliffhanger and so I had some readers who didn't realize it was a series and they were so upset like oh my gosh I can't believe you did that and I was like please don't worry there's a sequel coming out it's coming out the same year as this book so you don't have to wait too much longer um and so like oh okay you know <laughs> so I do understand like you know, as a reader like when you hit a cliffhanger it's like ah oh, um, but yeah, I this is nothing. Yeah. February to December, it's, it's not like George R. R. Martin that has kept yeah. us waiting for so long. Exactly. Or, you know, or no I worked, man, you know, like there are so many books. I'm just like, come on. Yeah. I worked, I worked very hard with a very intense deadline to be able to keep this December pub date. Um, because we got a little behind schedule. So I was like, what can I do for this book to continue? You know, I want this book to come out the same year because that's what we had planned on. Um so yeah, it's like just how how I could just see it was the perfect way to end. And I do think if you are having a sequel, readers do need a little bit of tension to make them want to pick up the sequel too. So it is important to end on such a way that readers want to jump into the next book. Uh, do some rapid fire questions to all my guests. It's nothing, <laughs> just, you know, your preference, super fast. Here we go. You ready? Yes. All right. Series or standalone? Ooh, I, I think I have to say series. Okay. Um, I think you answered this, but do you like music or the quiet? When music, music. Are you uh, a, a, a night owl or a morning glory? Definitely morning person. <laughs> do you prefer uh, indoor or outdoor? Indoor. Slow burn or fast pace? Slow burn. Uh, do you dream in color or black and white? Color. Awesome. And do you have the journal? Like you talked about having your journal, like what that looks like. Your yeah, you so with, like just I just want to see a sample of what that looks like. Okay, let me see if I can find one. Um, so each book has its own journal. Um, actually, this one might be too spoiler. I have the one for Divine Rivals on my desk. Let me see. Um, but typically, what I'll do is just like. I'll get like a really pretty journal, like from Papier. And then I literally will just like, like, I'll just start filling the pages with just like, 
thoughts, ideas, random things, scenes. Um, so this is this one is typically just for brainstorming where I'm trying to figure out like what my next idea is. Um, so a lot of times I will I'll just like write down very random things and sometimes nothing ever like comes about from those ideas. But I have had like with Dreams Lie Beneath, that book in particular, I had an idea for it um, and I just couldn't make it work. And I was like getting really frustrated and I wrote all these ideas down in my journal. It's like something's missing from this idea. I'm not sure what it is. I think I was really just lacking the plot. Um, and then years later, I came back to it when I was needing to pitch that book to her for teen. I was like, I really want to write about these magicians and I'm just not sure. So I kind of sat down and I was able to kind of bring in like older, like random older ideas and kind of like weave them all together. And all of a sudden I had a plot. So sometimes I'm like those journals can be gold. Sometimes if I write something down that feels like, I'll never come back to this. And then, you know, five years later, it's like, oh, like I'm ready to write this idea. Like it simmered long enough that I know what it needs to actually grow into a full novel. Well, and we're happy that that journal exists because if <laughs> not, you may not have been able to pitch to an adult audience, right? So that's right. pretty cool. It appeased them long enough. All right. If you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand and I will call on you. If not, I have a lot of questions still to ask. So, um, while we're waiting, I will say, my question's back over here. Um, you mentioned book of the month. How did you find out, like, how does that, how did that process work for you? Because that's a big deal. Like you said, not many fantasy books are chosen. We did talk to Vaishnavi Patel with Kaiki, which is a really great novel as well. Um, and that tends to go a little bit more fantasy, but how, what was your experience like? So I honestly had no idea it was even, actually, I take that back. Like, when I had like my big like publicity marketing meeting with my team, so I was like meeting them for the first time, like on Zoom, um, they, my publicist had written up, these are all the places we're pitching your book to. And so I'm sure like book of the month was on that list. Um, but I didn't really think about it until I got the email from my editor and it came in at like 5, 15 PM, like on a Thursday, like a month before like February, like so in January. And she said, oh, you know, they've chosen it for one of their February picks. And I was just like so blown away. Like I, I was like cooking on the skill and I completely like burned dinner because I was like, oh, my gosh, like I just cannot believe this, you know. Um, so I think it is. I think it's your publicist really will will work to like pitch your book to different avenues, you know, book clubs, things like that. And so um, book of the month, of course, like they're kind of looking at all the upcoming books for the month. And of course, they're reading and then they decide what they're going to pick. But I was very, very happy that they they um, had a Fire Endless as an add-on. So I had so many readers like asking me, is a Fire Endless going to be an add-on? Like I want my additions to match. And I couldn't say anything because it's confidential. So I was like, I really don't know. Like I can't reply yet. But I was like, just wait. Like you, you'll probably find out very soon. And so it, I was very happy though and honored that they chose it. So it is an add-on for December if you want to match your additions. Did, did you know sooner about the add-on or was it about the same timing? I feel like, I think they kind of decide typically like three to two months out. Um, so I remember I, I learned about the add-on, like not, it was probably about two or three months ago. So it does, it kind of runs again. I think the three month mark is when they really start finalizing what they're going to be featuring. Now you've been giving snippets. Um, on a fire endless, like a quote here, a quote there. How do you decide what you're going to share? I don't know. Sometimes I, you know, I feel like it's really helpful. Like when I'm reading through the book for the hundredth time for revisions, like, you know, I try to start pulling lines that I think will be good to share because it's nice to have them all just like in a word document. So when I need to make a graphic or something, um, or I have a reader, you know, I, I did a pre-order campaign with my local indie avid bookshop. And so one of the things is, is like, I'm personalizing the books. If you want me to write like a quote in there, I will. So some readers do, they want me to write a favorite quote. So like I have to like choose like which quote am I going to write in there? Um, so I do, I think I just like from just remembering what I was writing, like moments where if I wrote a line that I thought was like, I really love that I could later use as a quote, I would, I just kind of pull it aside or I'd wait till the manuscript is copy edited. So at least I'm pulling like a grammatically correct sentence out because- Or one um, that hasn't been cut, right? <laughs> right, also, yeah. I think there was a while back that I shared 
um, a snippet and I was like, is this Torin or is this, is this about Torin or Jack? Cause it's a very emotional snippet. And I didn't say which man, like which character. So people are voting if it's Torin or Jack. And then that snippet ended up kind of getting condensed down or cut, like a few lines got cut out of it. So I was like, oh my gosh, I shared the snippet and had everyone guess who it is. And then it kind of had to change a little bit. It's like, I just need to wait till copy edits come through. <laughs> But well, uh, Emma Cena said, thankful for a book of the month for picking this book and a, ch- a river enchanted was an unexpected favorite this year. I hesitate to give it my absolute favorite this year because she hasn't finished a fire endless, which what a compliment. Um, I think that's, I think that's all our sentiments. Um, all right. So we do have a few minutes. Um, we would love for you to share a little bit, read a little bit of a fire endless, give us a little bit of a highlight if you don't mind. Okay. Um, so I think I was trying to think like, which, like, what do I want to read out of here? Um, and so I think I'm actually just going to read that with like the beginning of the prologue, because I'm very excited about this prologue. Um, because I, it's actually told from one of the fairies points of view, so it's a spirit of the northern wind and Kay that you're going to see a lot of. So she is a new character. And I really loved opening the book with like a glimpse of Bane's court. So we're finally seeing like on the other side of the veil now, we're seeing things. So I'm going to read maybe like um, like a page and a half from the prologue, if that sounds okay. Sounds great. Thank you. Once Kay had carried thousands of words in her hands. As a spirit of the wind, she had reveled in the power of it to cradle things that were both fragile and sharp, and it had always been a delight when she chose to release them. To fill the timbers and textures of those many voices from deep to airy, from melodious to rough hewn. Once she had let gossip and news melt through her fingers and unspool across the hills of cadence, watching how humankind reacted when they caught the words, either like hail or like thistledown. It had never failed to amuse her, but that had been when she was younger, hungrier and uncertain of herself. When the older spirits had relished biting the edges of her wings to make them tattered and weak, eager to override her routes. King Bane had not yet appointed her as his favored messenger, and even with frayed wings and mortal voices as her closest companions. Kay could only fully appreciate that simpler era now as she glided over eastern cadence, reminiscing. There had come a moment when things started to shift, a moment that Kay could pinpoint in retrospect, realizing it was a seam in her existence. Lorna Tamerlane and her music. She had never sung for the spirits of the air, although Kay often watched from the shadows as the bard called to the sea, to the earth. Kay had at first been relieved Lorna didn't summon the winds, and yet how often the spirit still yearned for it. To know Lorna's notes were crafted just for her and to feel them thrum in her bones. That was the moment Kay had ceased carrying words and delivering them elsewhere, because she knew what Bane would have done to Lorna had he realized what she was doing, playing for the earth and water garnering approval and admiration from those spirits. And Kay, who had been spun into existence by a stormy northern wind, had only laughed at gossip and let her wings howl over the cross of cadence, had felt her heart splinter when Lorna had died far too young. She flew over the eastern side of the isle now, admiring the summits and valleys, the gleaming faces of locks, and the trickling paths of rivers. Smoke rose from cottage chimneys, gardens teemed with summer fruit, and flocks of sheep grazed on hillsides. Kay was nearing the clan line when the pressure in the air drastically changed. Her wings trembled in response, her indigo hair tangling across her face. It was an act to make her cower and cringe, and she knew the king was summoning her. She was late in returning to make her report, and he was impatient. With a sigh, Kay flew upwards. She left behind the tapestry of cadence and cut through layers of clouds, watching light fade into endless darkness. She could feel time freeze around her. There was no day, no hour here in the hall of the wind. It was preserved amongst the constellations. The sensation had once been jarring decay. To observe time flowing so unhindered amongst the humans on the aisle and then leave it behind like a moth-eaten cloak. Remember your purpose, Kay thought sharply as the last second a mortal time cracked and fell from her wings like ice. She needed to prepare herself for this meeting because Bane was going to ask about Jack Tamerlane. I'm so ready. Oh, I love story time. <laughs> and Sonia said she loved the quote, a seam in her existence. It's so beautiful and powerful. And yeah, I saw someone like grab their chest. Like we're so <laughs> ready for this book too. So you can't get here fast enough. Um, 
I am just so pumped. Um, I will ask a couple of more questions. Um, one, people want to know what you're reading. What would you recommend? I know you've been super busy deadline to deadline. Do you even find time to read? I guess is a better question. Yeah. So it's interesting that most of my reading this year has been for blurbs for other authors. So I technically like have not really gotten to read much for pleasure, but it's still very nice to read these really wonderful stories like before they hit shelves. Um, so I know one that I really love that actually is out now is Forest Fall by Lyndall Clipstone. That is a YA fantasy. It is the conclusion of her Lake's Edge duology. Just, I, I honestly like every single line that Lyndall writes is just so poetic and beautiful. I'd almost just like it almost makes me mad. I'm like, Lyndall, how can you write this beautiful all the time? It's just so, so lovely. Um, I also just finished reading um, Psyche and Eros by Luna McNamara. That book will be coming out with uh, William Morrow, I think in May. And it is a retelling of Cupid and Psyche myth, and I, which is one of my favorite Greek myths. Um, very beautifully told. Um, Who's the author on that one? Luna McNamara and she, that's okay. her debut so um I'm trying to think what else um I know let's see I know you like prepared me for this and I'm still like well, do, you, do you have that? any old favorites maybe like an old series that you would be like this is a must read if you haven't yes absolutely so especially if you loved A River Enchanted and you're looking for more Celtic inspired fantasies I highly recommend Juliet Marillier she has um, she has quite the backlist. I will say, um, I would recommend Daughter of the Forest. Start with that one. It's like the beginning of her Seven Water series. Um, I remember like the first time I read that book, I was just like very deeply moved and just like sobbed. So, um, just absolutely gorgeous. And then, um, I always recommend Melina Marquetta's books. So she is an Australian author. So you might not be as familiar with her here in the States. Um, she is like an award-winning author, writes these very, very beautiful character-driven stories. So I highly recommend, again, if you're a fantasy reader, um, to check out her Lumetere Chronicles. It is a trilogy. So you'll start with Finnegan of the Rock. And I feel like, like I'm always like craving like fantasies that she, like, like this series where it's just very character-driven. There's like a huge cast. Um, I was invested in every single one of her characters. I was like crying over secondary characters. It's just that powerful how she develops them. And they're all very flawed, but still very lovable. So I always like feel like I don't have much time to reread very many books, but I always like reread like that series because it's just so good. It hits me in the feels every time I reread it. Well, you talked about what's coming up for you. We're excited for your upcoming books, obviously Tuesdays, but the, also the ones after that. Um, but I would like to ask a different kind of question to end. Um, what's a question you've never been asked, but wish you had been asked so that you could answer it? Oh my gosh. You know, I have been asked quite a few <laughs> questions. Um, I actually just hosted a read along for River Enchanted because, um, I wanted to, so first of all, I have never read one of my published books cover to cover, like after it's published and out, like I, I might go back and reread favorite moments and be like, oh yeah, I remember writing this or I love this moment. Um, but I've almost been a little too afraid to read a, one of my published books like cover to cover because I might, that perfectionism in me might be like, oh, why did I write this this way? But I was like, you know what? I think River Enchanted is like, I, I want to reread this book like after it's published. And so I was like, well, why don't I do a read along and invite readers to join me because it's perfect. You know, if, if some people read it back in February and they want to reread, this is the perfect time. So the sequel's about to come out. Or people who've been kind of delaying reading it. Again, perfect time to read it for the first time. So one of the things I had them, like I'd put a question box in Instagram. They'd be like, okay, every week before I do my live chat, because um, I broke it up by, because there's three parts in the book. So like week one was, we were reading part one. Week two, we're reading part two. Week three, reading part three. So every Saturday I had an Instagram live. So I was like, well, I need, you know, I don't know what how to structure these lives. So I just asked, hey, will y'all please submit questions for me to answer? Um, on Friday so then I could kind of know a pool of questions to like answer I got asked so many questions like I mean just things I had never thought of and I had you know I had some very more generic questions like what inspired you or you know which character was like your favorite to write which was the hardest to write 
But then I had some readers like super intuitive, like asking these very deep analytical questions about the novel, which I was just like, wow, like I've never even, never even thought of that. Um, so I was like really blown away again by like, again, the amount of questions and then just again, how deeply some readers were thinking or like, again, like analyzing the text, which I thought was just like really fascinating. Um, I'm trying to think like one person, I'll just say this one person asked, what surprised you the most about rereading your book? And so I was like, let me think about this again. This is the first time I've read one of my books cover to cover. And it's like, honestly, I'm surprised that I, I, I love it so much even now. Like there's nothing I would change about it. Um, I'm honestly so proud of the book. And then I'm like, this is just, I don't know. I almost wish that I hadn't written it so I could experience it as a reader. Like it's the type of book, I wrote the type of book that I want to find on the shelf and read. So if any of you have recommendations for books that you think are similar, um, I would love to hear them. But um, so I think that honestly surprised me the most. And that was a question like I never expected to really be asked. So I'll just end with that. <laughs> well, I love it because I mean, what better compliment, right? One that you enjoyed it as much, but that it just made you want to be a reader of your book. Like, I love that cyclical, like, you know, you're, you're right right back around. I just, I thought it was fantastic. Um, well, you've been a delight. I've absolutely loved every minute. I still have a million questions, but we are at an hour. So um, if you do have suggestions for, for Rebecca to read, she's on Instagram. You can drop. She's very active. You have a great account, by the way. Um, I love, I love seeing all of it, um, but thank you so much. And especially the readers out there for joining us tonight, please make sure to check out her website. It's fantastic. Follow her on Instagram for all the latest news. And I'd love everybody to follow the LBs um, on Facebook and on Instagram. And you'll find recommendations, reviews. And then also on you, I'll be posting this recording on YouTube. So check that out. On Sunday, January 8th at 8 p.m., I'm hosting author Brady Godfrey to discuss her debut solo novel. And I'm sorry, it's a one word title. It's, it's called Imposter. So <laughs> and it's her first one. So she has um, co-written, uh, I think it's called The Beach Trap. But anyways, um, it was the, it's an Apple Best Books of September. And it's a psychological thriller exploring sisterhood secrets and the neuroscience of memory. Lisa Unger says, a slick and slippery as a dark icy road. Imposter has it all. Tense, immersive, and smart. This is a must read. Um, Mary Kubica says, Every, everything a psychological thriller should be, unsettling, totally immersive, and completely unpredictable. Spine-chillingly, jaw-droppingly good. So if those two don't get you, I don't know what would. Um, but it sounds like the perfect way to jumpstart 2023. So join us the second Sunday in January. Everybody enjoy your holiday break if you're taking that break. Thanks, Mike, for running behind the scenes. And if you know of an author you'd like to hear from, message me and again, subscribe to my YouTube channel. And I just look forward to all these chats. Y'all, you're great. Thank you so much. And thank you for your interaction with, with all your readers. I think it makes it even more special. You do such an awesome job and uh, good day. Good night. I know some people are up late, um, but thank y'all again. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Enjoy the holidays, everybody. Good night.